Hey friends, how are you doing? I am coming to you today. I'm actually coming out of quarantine for the first time in a while um, in order to come to this site, in order to do some soul searching, in order to do some reflecting right now. Um, tonight is the anniversary of one of uh, the most infamous events in Los Angeles history. Um, tonight we commemorate um, the anniversary of the Zoot Suit Riots, which began on this night 77 years ago. The Zoot Suit Riots raged through the city of Los Angeles. Um, the so-called Zoot Suit Riots, they raged from June 3rd through June 10th of 1943. Now, where are we? Right now, we're standing off of Figueroa near the corner of Alpine Street right here. And we're standing in front of what is the Kim, um, the, the Kim Sing Theater. Now, the Kim Sing Theater here, historically, it was known as the Carmen Theater. The Carmen Theater um, was rather unique um, in this area in that um, it was um, in an age of segregation. This was a non-segregated uh, movie house and um, a small little independent neighborhood uh, movie house which served um, you know the neighborhoods just north of downtown Los Angeles um, as well as Chinatown and the residents of Chavez Ravine. Um, we are just um, south of Dodger Stadium of historic Chavez Ravine. So when we talk about this area it's important that we keep in mind that historically this theater right here was one of the few non-racially segregated theaters within this area. Consequently, um, interestingly enough, in 1943, it would also get one more complicated um, group of residents that would come to this theater. They would be the soldiers, the Marines and the Navy men of the United States Navy who were stationed right here in Chavez Ravine at the armory between what was historic Chavez Ravine Road, today's Stadium Way, and Lilac Terrace. And um, today the armory still stands there. That, as you'll recall, was the primary location of the Navy and the Marines when they were barracked and when they were trained for World War II. Consequently, with an overlap of these groups of people here, um, there began to be some skirmishes between the Chicano residents within the neighborhood as well as um, the soldiers within the area. Interestingly enough, though the um, historic Zutsu riots begin on June 3rd of 1943, the actual events which were used to justify the riots actually had begun days earlier on um, on the, the day of May 30th. What happens is that right here um, in front of this theater, there had been some groups of Mexican Americans um, who had just been coming out of a movie, um, as well as some um, white um, Navy men who were um, hanging out in front of the theater. Um, there was also um, an increase of traffic of um, Navy service personnel because these are the roads that split from going to the Vadrio and then also going over to the armory. And um, what happens is that um, there began to be um, some um, animosity between these groups, mostly because what else do guys normally fight over other than girls? And that's what um, really kind of happened. What happens is that some of the um, the Navy servicemen had made some advances at um, some of the guys, you know, girlfriends. And, uh, and some of them had even um, treated some of the young ladies um, within the barrio like they were prostitutes. And that really offended, um, of course, the, the Chicanos of the neighborhood. And uh, what happens is that there began to be um, kind of some, you know, heated exchanges. But at one point, as the groups just started, you know, started to divide, what happens is that um, one of the um, young Mexican-Americans just made like a gregarious move with his hand, you know, talking with his hands. And um, what happens is that one of the, um, one of the Navy service personnel um, took that as for like throwing a punch or something and descended on the guy and started grabbing him. 
once a Navy serviceman started beating down on a Mexican-American, all the rest of the Mexican-Americans that were standing around began to beat on the soldiers. They had them great on the, the Navy service personnel. They had them greatly outnumbered. And so what happens is that on May 30th, um, what happened here is we ended up with, um, you know, one young man uh, um, who was beat up, um, who, you know, was beat up and was dragged back to his, you know, to the barracks. Um, you know, his buddies had, you know, complained about what happened there, but that was on May 30th. And um, so what happens is that, so, you know, he had just really gotten kind of minor, you know, some, some, some minor injuries in the skirmish. Uh, but what happens is that as the telling of the story of Mexican-Americans attacking one of our boys in, in, in uniform, you know, how dare they do that, you know, while they're fighting this war, well, what happens is that as the urban legend of this story got to be told, it went from there being, you know, just a, uh, you know, just a, a um, you know, fisticuffs to, you know, someone getting stabbed, from someone getting stabbed to someone, uh, you know, being hospitalized, from someone being hospitalized to someone being murdered. And, you know, it just kept getting out of control, you know, the, the exaggeration of what the situation was. Um, you know, in how it was told in the urban legends um, outside of the downtown area, it had reached throughout Southern California, um, angering people all around who wanted to come back in order, in order to show those Mexicans who they thought were um, out of control and indeed too big for their britches and they were going to show them something. And so what happens is that after days of, uh, you know, pretty much being, um, you know, trained on what to do in order to spark these riots, um, what happens is that finally on June 3rd, there would be a group of Navy servicemen that would make their way from the armory and descend right here down Alpine Street, first attacking Kim Singh Theater, dragging Mexican-Americans from the theater and starting to beat them in the streets. Now, one of the things about it is that um, the, um, you know, the way that they, um, that, 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 that they villainized Mexican-Americans was as making all Mexican-Americans out as being pachucos, as being zoot suiters. And so what they did is they didn't just beat Mexican-Americans, but what they did is they actually ripped their zoot suits from them and um, burned them in the streets, you know, like you would burn, like you would burn a flag. And, um, you know, people would be left in a bloody mess, naked in the streets, um, before they were arrested by the police who were complicit to all of this. And um, so um, white Navy service personnel went down Alpine Street, down Figueroa, into theater, into the theater here, into restaurants, into stores, grabbing Mexican-Americans, many of them as young as um, 14 years old, and um, stripping them of their clothes and beating them, um, leaving them in heaps within the streets. And um, so that began here at this location on June 3rd of 1943. And I actually have some pictures of, um, you, know, it, you know, the theater really hasn't changed much over the years, as you'll see. Um, this is just after, you know, this is just after, about a few years after the Zoot Suit Riots, when this area got redeveloped as the new Chinatown, the old Sonora Town became the new Chinatown. And uh, so this is the pictures of, you know, the old Carmen Theater. And um, it really hasn't changed much, you know, over um, the years. Um, what is on the Carmen Theater today? Um, unfortunately, um, you know, there really is no designation. There is no historical marker that this was the starting point of the Zoot Suit Riots. The, you know, the infamous Zoot Suit Riots of 1943. There's no plaque or anything which states it. Um, the um, theater, it, um, uh, it, you know, what's interesting about it is that later on, in recent years, um, it was purchased by a company that kind of made it a, um, you know, kind of like a, um, how, how can I explain it? Like an Airbnb for creatives um, that, uh, you know, you could rent all of this space in order to, you know, um, you know do whatever creative work. Um, that you're interested in. And um, when I had looked up the new Kim Singh Theater, 
Um, one of the first um, reviews, first rave reviews for it was by uh, Katy Perry, who was, um, who, who was uh, going on about how grateful she was, you know, to have this space available to her uh, when she was creatively homeless. And uh, so, yeah. For those of you who've been on the Zoot Suit Riot bus tour, we normally don't stop at this site. We go to the Orpheum Theater and the other big theaters and we put side by side, you know, some of the pictures, you know, some of the most, you know, horrific pictures, you know, of the Zoot Suit Riot. Um, you know, instead we go to, you know, those sites also because they are just a lot more, you know, accessible. But um, yeah, we, you know, as you'll recall, we you go by the Orpheum Theater. Uh, then I show you the exact spots where, you know, many of these pictures were taken. Um, but um, we normally don't go by here, normally because what happens is that it is really hard within this area for us to be able, you know, to stop a tour bus. And, um, you know, there's usually valets that are out here. And so we're not able to actually stop right in front of the building. So normally what we go on to is to, you know, Chavez Ravine and to the Armory and we pick up the storytelling from there. Um, what's interesting that, that, you know, I really should note about that, though, is that, um, you know, the Armory there, there is a huge parking lot that is just to the west of the Armory there, um, right off of Stadium Way. And interestingly enough, right now, um, that parking lot is being used, um, the Dodgers parking lot is being used for people to um, get the COVID-19 testing. And um, so that's what they're using that space out there for. Um, interestingly, for those of you who know Los Angeles history, you'll recall that that is also um, very, very close to where the um, sanatorium was. Um, and so, you know, historically, there used to be sanatoriums just to the west of there um, that, um, you know, treated people for, you know, tuberculosis and stuff like that, you know, when there was... And, um, also, when there was other epidemics like the Spanish flu, there were, you know, um, sanatoriums in which you could isolate people um, within clinics out there away from the larger population. But, um, yeah, that today is um, where they are doing the, um, the COVID-19 testing. Um, yeah, but I wanted to come out to this site to, um, you know, reflect on the, you know, the history of uh, the Zoot Suit Riots on this, um, you know, this real catastrophe, this real traumatic event um, within Mexican-American history that, um, you know, is um, rarely understood. Um, but what we do need to understand about the Zoot Suit Riots is that, um, you know, it is one of these moments within history in which, um, you know, we need to kind of understand that, that uh, Mexican-Americans um, young Mexican Americans were really, believe it or not, taken by surprise by the level of white supremacy that was just really increasing within our country, especially during times of nationalism, during the times of World War II. Um, you know, there was a lot of complications psychologically going on within, you know, our country at the time. And unfortunately, anyone that seemed to be a little bit foreign, you know, really um, had a hard time in the backdrop, um, you know, of, you know, of World War II within our country and stuff like this. And, um, you know, what's very, very um, difficult about this is that, you know, um, one of the things that is often misunderstood about that generation, the Pachuco generation, the, um, you know, the Zoot Suiters, that generation of young people, is that, um, you know, they were not some ultra-ethnic um, group of young people that, you know, ultra-ethnic hipsters that were revolting against American society and therefore got kicked in the pants for it. Um, it was quite the opposite. The reality is, is that Zoot Suiters were um, a reflection of American culture. Mexican Americans had adopted a style of dress and were, you know, dancing to a style of music, um, it, you know, that, that, that was part of the American experience, the jazz swing music. Um, and unfortunately about this, one of the things that, you know, is common when you have something that is kind of culturally revolutionary um, within, uh, you know, within America from the 20th century up is that uh, 
you know, the, the cool things tend to come from the black kids. They tend to start from the black kids. Uh, just like my generation, we had, you know, kind of the rap and R&B. The jazz swing was kind of the, the, the music that animated the working class communities of Mexican Americans and uh, people adopted the style of it. And um, so and on one hand, you had, um, you know, young people that were adopting this style that was an African American style. But in reality, in what they were trying to do by adopting the style was not trying to stand against, you know, American culture. But indeed, they were actually assimilating. They actually were starting to um, want to be part of the nightlife that would be found downtown. They wanted to go to the movie theaters. They wanted to go to the dance clubs like everyone else. Um, they were now earning money now that the Great Depression was over and now that the wartime was bringing great jobs. They wanted to spend their money, not like the generations previously who were too scared to go to the centers of town. They just went there to work, to clean their buildings and do, you know, their menial jobs and then came back, you know, to our own communities in order to have our own, our own entertainment, did not really, um, you know, take the initiative to be out and to try to challenge the racial segregation that was going on in downtown Los Angeles. And young Mexican Americans, young Chicanos who were born in this country at this time, decide that they want to take a claim out on the town like everyone else, that um, they want to go to the movie theaters, they want to go uh, to the restaurants, they want to do all of these things. And unfortunately, there is, um, there is a repulse by white society um, who thinks that these um, young Mexican Americans in their, uh, you know, 42 inch inseam zoot suits um, are too big for their britches and they need to make a stand. Otherwise, you know, these Mexican Americans are going to think that their this town is theirs. And um, consequently, this really becomes one of the most traumatic events for Mexican American histories. And it is important that we do remember, however, it does become a moment in which Mexican Americans um, start to um, realize, start to realize one reality that um, we can no longer believe the white supremacist lie that we had bought into. And, um, you know, there's a lot of people in this country that buy into the white supremacy of this country. And that doesn't mean that they want to gas Mexican-Americans or black people or, or, or they want to execute, you know, all of these minorities. Um, but, but, but they do create a white supremacist lie that many of us feed to our, our, our own children in which we teach people of color that if they just behave, then they shouldn't have anything to worry about. Then the authorities and then people, you know, they, they you know, if they just behave, then they have nothing to worry about. And um, that's a lie. Historically shows us over and over and over and over again um, that, that, that that's not the case. And um, so this becomes a moment in which there is a self-awareness, a coming aware of a coming of age for Mexican-American people who realize that they are going to stake, take a stand. They're going to take a claim within their own city that they're no longer going to um, especially remain. Um, you know, remain segregated away, hiding in the backdrops of a city in which their ancestors had founded. And um, so the Zoot Suit Riots become, you know, really one of these moments in which, um, you know, the, the, the blowback that Mexican Americans receive from white society for just wanting to belong. Um, you know, they're going to really have to rethink and they're going to really have to start directly involving themselves in civil rights in the years to come. And so that's why the Zoot Suit Riots um, becomes um, really one of these moments that all Mexican-Americans talk about, that all Chicanos teach their children is because it really is the coming of age of American-born Mexicans who are deciding that they are no longer going to live by the Jim Crow segregation and they're no longer going to live um, under the values of white supremacy that is leaving us um, disenfranchised, that is causing us to self-segregate. And um, so that's a major, 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 major moment um, in history that we should all be teaching our children about. Um, from you know, today on through June 10th, I'm going to continue to talk more about the history of the Zoot Suit Riots, um, what played out, 
um, how, um, you know, how Mexican-American communities reacted um, and, um, you know, really what the legacy is today and how we um, do that storytelling, how Mexican-Americans, as how Chicanos engage that storytelling. But um, I can't stay out too late because um, there is um, a quarantine. You know, we just, you know, I just felt out Chingon being able to get out you know, get out on the town because one quarantine had ended and now I have another stay at home order <laughs> to be in by nine o'clock. And, um, you know, I, I, I'm grateful for all of you um, who, you know, love my work and know what I do, not just as a historian, but as an activist and that are offering all your support, including bail money. Um, but I don't plan on getting arrested. Um, and um, that's really one of the things right now, as you'll notice, is that as the protests are going on, I'm having to unusually stay, you know, stand back um, because, you know, I'm immunocompromised. You know, I don't really have much of an immune system. And um, so that, uh, that um, you know, if I got a cold or the flu normally, it puts my life at risk, let alone if I got, you know, COVID-19. So I'm having to, you know, kind of um, be, you know, kind of tactical, standing back and stuff like this. Um, but, um, you know, I've been here, <laughs> I've been here standing back. I do not plan on getting arrested this time around. Um, fortunately, I always find myself at the wrong place at the wrong time, getting attacked by someone and ended up getting arrested for it in the end. Uh, the good thing about that is that usually I win money from the police department. Uh, not that I can, you know, really talk about it in detail because, you know, you had to settle some of these cases, but, you know, usually I've won a few... <laughs> few lawsuits for, 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 you know, believe it or not, you know, I've, I've won quite a few lawsuits when it comes to this um, for actually getting arrested after being attacked by white supremacists at some type of events. And, um, but I don't want that to happen at this time. But I want us throughout, um, you know, from, you know, tonight um, through, um, you know, June 10th um, for us to, you know, consider um, the, 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 you know, events of the Zoot Suit Riots, um, to remember, um, you know, the different times within our city in which there were unrest and what, um, you know, what not just civic leaders did, but what people of faith, um, what um, civil rights leaders, um, what a mom and pops who made a difference, um, you know, in the neighborhood, um, you know, who were there, you, you know, helping out, you know, in the backdrop of all that, cladic all that cataclysm. I want us to reconsider that and to think about the lessons that we could learn. Um, also, I want us to consider the other riots that, you know, happened within Los Angeles, the, the you know, the, the Watts riots and all these different types of, you know, events in order for us to remember, you know, historically what people did in order to, um, you you know, in order to stand for justice and, um, you know, to, to also just not be bystanders. A lot of people are worried about being bystanders in the backdrop of all this protest, as some people are taking advantage of the situation in order to cause, you know, violence and destruction. Unfortunately, you know, usually when, um, you know, how looting usually becomes is that, you know, once, um, you know, glass window fronts or something gets broken, people's sense of honesty um, tends to degrade and, you know, it you know, starts to get into looting you know, and stuff like that. But, um, you know, I, I, I want us, you know, to recall, you know, the times in history in which our communities, you know, stood together in order to, you know, put the focus back on, you know, on, on the issue in order to um, repel and to deflect looting in the communities. And we've often done that by not being bystanders. If we don't want to be harmed as bystanders, then don't be bystanders. Don't stand by. Stand on the front lines with people during this time as people are fighting for justice. And, um, you know, to give you an example, Cantor's Daly, they stayed open through the entirety of what was going on, handing out water um, to the protesters. Yeah, some immature kids did a little bit of, 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 of painting on the walls, but they weren't allowed to pray. They were stopped before they tried to get on the glass or the neon signs or did everything. A little bit of paint, touch up. What did Cantor say? That they were standing with Black, Black Lives Matters, you know, in this time. I think all of us really at this time, we need to stop being bystanders. You know, as a person of faith, especially, you know, a lot of us, you know, ethnic people are very religious people. I myself 
And you know, the, the Bible says, the Torah teaches, you know, do, do not stand idly by the blood of your brother, the blood of your neighbor. And, and um, you know, we can't, we can't do that. The scriptures also, you know, re, re, remind us that, that, you know, that, uh, you know, that, that, you know, Zedek, Zedek, Der Dov, justice, justice shall you pursue. And, um, you know, the interesting thing about that, the word Der Dov is, is, you know, pursue means to like chase something down. Pursuing justice um, is it, isn't just us ordering it on eBay, to us tweeting it. What we need to do is, is that we need to pursue justice. We need to hunt it down. We need to pursue it, chase it down in order to make our voices heard that we are demanding justice. And I think we can do that in peaceful ways. Um, there are many people around the city that are looking, um, that, 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 that are looking at the pain that black people in this country are feeling and the demands that are being made for, made for reform. And we are joining with you in peaceful protests throughout the streets. And I encourage people to continue on about this, uh, you know, through this type of demonstration. But um, tonight, on the anniversary um, of the Zoot, the, you know, the Zoot Suit Rise, the 77th anniversary, um, I want us to reflect on all of those different calamities within our city history and figure out what we can learn, the, the, what we saw the best of from people and how we can um, you know, reflect that, how we can be on um, those type of people in our generation, how we can live up to that type of heritage of what people did in the past to make a difference. Um, I think there's a lot of beautiful things that we can talk about um, over the next week as we commemorate um, the history of the Zutsu Rise. But for now, I need to get in and, uh, um, and be safe. All of you that are protesting out there, um, be very, very safe and um, be vigilant in order to not let people inject, um, you know, in, inject, um, you know, violence and, and, and vandalism and looting into our peaceful riots. It is our, it is for us to make sure that people do not um, you know, try to, you know, um, try to frame our voice in the wrong way if we have something to do about it. And so I'm very grateful for all of you who are out there who are standing with, you know, who are, who are standing for righteousness and justice out there on the street. Thank you, everyone. And um, be well, be safe.